is great. Take more time if needed. Uh, of course, it is here we are December 8th, and I'm sure a lot of people are at holiday parties and it's a little cold out. Um, come on in. Good to see you, Rachman. Have a seat. Uh, this is a this is a hybrid meeting, so as you can see, we've got uh, we're down here at Happy Valley Elementary School live, and uh, we're also on Zoom. If you're in the Zoom audience, uh, when we get to question and answer period, you can just um, raise your hand using the little reactions button in the bottom, and uh, then we'll call on you so you can ask your question live. Uh, you're welcome to make no some notes in the chat, and Shane, who is our analyst doing the online portion tonight. Thanks for the wave, Shane. Um, might be able to respond to you, um, but as far as questions that will actually that, that I'll respond to during Q and A, we'll do that. Um, we'll, we'll ask that you speak those live. Uh, I'm going to start with a couple of slides, just talk about some of the things going on here in Happy Valley that I'm aware of, and then I will. Really, the whole goal of these town hall meetings and rotating through the different parts of the district is to hear what's going on from your point of view. Um, so hopefully, we'll, we should have plenty of time for that. All right, I'm just go ahead and share my screen here. Okay, I will speak up a little bit as well. Um, so we've got a few location-based issues. We'll talk a little bit about Brant's Forty Fire. Um, and is Joe Serrano coming tonight? Oh, he's always oh, on. He's you're alive. All right, Joe. Um, if Shane, if you can make sure that Joe is. Uh, promoted to a co-host so that we can call on him when we get to that part, uh, which will be here in just a minute. Um, we'll talk a little bit about some of the campers near De La Viega, I know is a, is a hot issue. Um, the broadband um, 5252 Brants of 40 case, which uh, I think we're, we're pretty close to resolving here. Uh, the broadband master plan that the county is pursuing uh, which will hopefully get some better internet to folks in this area. Um, and then just a little bit about housing and uh, then turn it over to you guys. So let's go ahead and start with the Brents of 40 fire update. And for this, I'll turn it over to Joe Serrano. Joe is our executive director of LAFCO, the local area formation commission. Uh, and they're um, helping to look at the uh, the merger that's being studied between Scotts Valley Fire and Brants of 40 Fire, and have been very involved with all that. Um, so, and I'll take the slides down so we can see you, Joe, here too. And Supervisor, uh, I, I'm not going to be able to turn on my microphone, uh, my webcam, but hopefully you can hear me. We can hear you. Give me one second. Uh, I'll turn up the volume so folks here. All right, go ahead and talk. Perfect. Uh, well, good evening, everyone. Uh, uh, hold you. on. Wait, we sure. can't really hear you. I'll try to enunciate as, as and speak loudly as I can. I don't know why my volume's not louder. Sure. Yeah, one second. Sure. No rush. Go ahead. All right, hopefully uh, everyone can hear me. Uh, well, uh, I'll try to keep this brief. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, Supervisor Koenig, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, this is an ongoing process to reorganize uh, the Branson 40 Fire Protection District. Uh, the goal of this is to ensure that the residents get the best level of service possible. Uh, that's the goal from the get-go. Um, the, the latest news is that the benefit assessment study, uh, the uh, consulting firm that was hired by Branson 40 Fire uh, will be providing preliminary data to the board and to the public, uh, hopefully uh, within the next couple of weeks. Uh, they will give the preliminary numbers of how much it would cost per parcel uh, to keep the fire station open. That's one of the, the, the key uh, components of this reorganization is that we heard from the residents that we want to keep the Branson 40 fire station open. And since Branson 40 fire has been historically understaffed and underfunded, one of the key things is, well, we need to make sure that there is sufficient funds to keep that fire station open. So we will have numbers to see what the cost is going to be for the residents. And then uh, after that information is provided to the board and to the public, 
uh, the, the board will decide to move forward with an election. So the residents themselves will determine uh, whether this benefit uh, assessment is uh, implemented. Uh, so it will up, it'll be up to the residents to determine the, the future of the Branson 40 fire station. Uh, another uh, quick update about this reorganization is there are now two vacancies on the Branson 40 fire board. Uh, we there's two resignations. So the board is uh, soliciting applications from the Branson 40 residents. So anyone who lives in Branson 40 fire uh, is a registered voter, they are encouraged to consider uh, serving on the Branson 40 fire board. Uh, there's going to be more information about the application process and the appointment process at the next Branson 40 fire board meeting, which will be next Thursday, December 15th at 6 p.m. Uh, that's what we're going to talk about in more detail about the appointment process, more detail about the benefit assessment study. Uh, and again, another opportunity for the residents to uh, have an opportunity to learn about this whole reorganization process. Uh, but uh, Supervisor Koenig, uh, with that, I'll, I'll I'll end it there. Those are the, the key uh, updates in this process, but I'm more than happy to answer any questions. Shane, do you have any questions online? Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Joe. We appreciate you being here tonight. And uh, again, the next meeting is December of the Brent's 40 Fire Board is December 16th. 15th. 15th. Okay. So exactly a week from today. Great. All right. Uh, I'm going to go back to my slides then. Check screen. Is this, do we have you to thank for this, Trina? Yes, yes. Okay. Well, uh, yes, it's um, hard not to notice the uh, folks that have been camping along De La Viega Park now for uh, some time. Um, I have started, I mean, reached out both to Tony Elliott, the director of city parks that oversees De La Viega Park, the sheriff's office, county public works, uh, and also sent the Santa Cruz Police Department to figure out how best to, I mean, uh, deal with these campers who really are right on the border line between jurisdictions. So the first thing that happened was um, the city went in and changed all of the signs. I think they were no parking overnight to no parking any time. Um, so now, because that is municipal code that they're that they're using there, the Santa Cruz Police Department will have to enforce people not parking there. So that was news. Our sheriff looked into that um, and said, "Okay, well, if it's municipal code. It's got to be the the PD." Um, so we're try I'll try to get the police department out there as soon as possible. Again, we're also working with the Parks Director Tony Elliott. Um, I also talked to our Public Works Department yesterday. They're happy to. Uh, erect some kind of a physical barrier to prevent people from parking there. Boulders. Well, they, they said boulders can be a bit dangerous because people could, could run into them. But the, the suggestion they were thinking of was was like the K-rail, uh, metal K-rail, since then no one, no one dies if they hit those. Um, however, we would want to hear from the Parks Department and the Santa Cruz Parks Department that they wanted us to do that. There is a bit of a, you know, it is a public park and we don't want to Put those up if that's not something the parks department wants us to do um let's see the last thing i'll say is you know trina you were saying you've noticed people changing their oil and stuff there that is definitely a concern as far as the environmental impact of that um and so i can also look at getting the resource conservation district and our environmental health department involved from that angle i mean uh long and short of it is I think there is strong consensus now between both the city and the county that we don't want to let any particular encampment get too large or established. I think we learned that lesson the hard way with the San Lorenzo River Camp. Um, and so I'll get the police department out here as soon as possible to ask people to. to... And all of this, 15 of them. It's not only that, if you're going to the bathroom. I saw like some driving here. So it's environmental also. Yeah. Right. And it's yeah. It's like dangerous because they leave behind all their trash and uh, it's, it's 
Uh, can you guys online hear folks in the audience? It's a little difficult. So if um, we could have one person speak at a time, we appreciate it. Because dispatch keeps saying, well, they're just going to go someplace else. They need a place to sleep. Well, we're putting up with this and, and the animals, everything in there, it's it's horrible. I cry when I go up and down sometimes. Mm -hmm. And then where the signs are, it says no overnight parking. They There's park 15 overnight. people. And it's yeah. like when you call in, nobody goes yeah. out there and does anything. The sheriff's office, I will say, where uh, just north of what we're talking about here, mm -hmm. there was a horrible problem. And there were about four of us that called constantly cleared the entire area and Granite Creek and they never came back. The okay. sheriff's office is really on it. That's my concern is if if they can't be there, they're just gonna move on up. Mm -hmm. You know, they're up uh, we live up Metro Spot Road, huh? Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want someone coming camping up there and they do once in a while. Sure. We already have a lot of people that use our road up and down. So it's like they just think that we are the down and they just come and put their old furniture or they leave an old van there turned upside down. And it's like, it gets to the point where it's dangerous. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, for our children on our road, my grandchildren, I mean, there's a lot of kids that live up that road. And it's just unhealthy. There's a lot of yeah. people that are drug ridden. And I just don't, I don't feel it's safe. And it's growing. It's yeah. Growing. I completely understand. So, for all, I mean, all the reasons you've listed, I mean, notably the environmental impacts of both people using the restroom uh, and changing their oil and, and, becoming, and, territorial. and becoming territorial. Yeah, I can, yeah. yeah, so for all those reasons, I mean, I think it is gonna be a matter of continued enforcement um, yeah. for this area, as well as if you know folks try to park on your road up Mystery Spot Road, um, that of course is, is the sheriff's office and we'll send deputies there. I came down the road one day about a year ago and somebody had unloaded a, uh, camper, put the jacks down, and mm -hmm. drove out from under it and just left it there. Oh, oh right. Yeah, yeah so that. And they're painting vehicles now too. Yeah, that was the other thing I'll, I'll make a note of is uh, I think our sheriff's office has a slightly more robust vehicle abatement program than the city's um, and has a, uh, some funds to actually tow vehicles. So I'll make sure we. Um, so what is the law with how long they can stay there before they're towed? Four days. Well, four days. If you're there four days, you're considered to be abandoned. And then you can call it. But now what they're starting to do is a lot of them is after the four days they know it and then they'll move 10 feet for another four That's days. That's the blue box. That's yeah, the blue box. Yeah. That's okay. And he waves and laughs at his <laughs> yeah yeah okay so we'll we'll get the police department out there as soon as possible to enforce the Do you suggest no parking call it certainly doesn't hurt it helps add some urgency to it well, if you're all the time, it's like, you know i mean like you said if it's a public health and, and safety it. hazard by all means call the police department it'll help uh so it's the police not the sheriff that's right well the sheriff is well if it's mystery spot right if it's another road, yeah, right. But in this case, because it's still really part of the city park and it says city municipal code, right. as far as the no parking signs, that it has to be a police officer that enforces the city law. I'm just wondering if they put no parking in those spots where it's kind of a, you know, where they're parking now, kind of in little U shapes before you get to George Washington, would they still park there? Because that seems to be the culprit. No, they're, that, they're parking no matter what the sign says. Oh, okay. Well, years ago, those logs weren't there. Right. And and you could pull all the way in there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then they put the logs there, but they didn't put them close enough to the road. Mm -hmm. Logs came about, about 15 years ago, and I contacted the uh, Parks and Rec in the city and was hit out to try and get yeah. it. seemed like a good fix. Yeah. You know, it was it, a it, cheap fix to go, you know? Right. Yeah, like I said, well, uh, that box costs a lot of money to get in there. I think the K rail is a good idea. Yeah, so we'll ex definitely, like I said, explore physical solutions with our public works department and city parks, and you know we'll do whatever they yeah, they want to. Somebody cares. Thank you. Oh. You're welcome. Yeah, no, I I when I'm when I'm not uh, officially on duty, I'm also riding my bike up here, so I've seen it go on now for many months. So.
Okay, um, let me, let's move along then. Um, good news on the 5252 Branson 40 code compliance case. This is where the large fire broke out uh, a little over a year ago now. Um, so you might remember we got code compliance to get got a signed stipulation order in place back in March of this year. They went out uh, nine times between July and November to that site and have been working very actively with the property owner. Uh, at this point, they reported me reported to me that as of uh, the beginning of November, they had the final inspection and all outst outstanding fees have been paid. The property is clean, um, and they're planning on. It's not the big. Uh... The great it's what building. the gal that was she was a teacher here years ago. But anyway, it's where the chop shop was, the great big fire that was back in there, where all the right. junk and the trailers and the cars and everything is here yeah, on the right hand there. side or the left? It's on the right hand side. Right. Yeah. Oh, it's been bad. It, there's always been yeah. things happening. That's so good. that well, glad to hear it. Great. Uh, a couple broader issues affecting the area. Um, the broad the board approved a broadband master plan uh, back in April. So basically, we hired a consultant. They're looking at uh, the entire county and where we have where the different levels of internet service throughout the county, and um, you know how many people live in all of those areas, um, and also I think they're factoring in um, you know whether they're the income levels and if they're um, uh, unserved or underserved areas. Um, so using all that, they're going to put together the broadband master plan for the county, which will really help to direct all the state and federal funds that are becoming available to expand broadband access to people. Um, so that's coming along. Could that be over the cable system? Um, potentially, yeah, or or potentially laying new uh, new cable. New cable. Yeah. Um, I did also have a meeting with AT&T's regional executive team, as well as our ISD director, uh, information services director for the county, uh, just to emphasize the importance of making sure we get um, good internet out here to rural parts of the county as well, um, both here in Happy Valley, as well as at the summit. Um, and our ISD director is also going to ensure that um, these harder to reach locations are included in the broadband master plan and um, will prioritize wherever possible. So um, it seems like the internet's working pretty good right now, which is, is good, but I know that's not always the case. That works pretty good, but it's just so expensive. Mm -hmm. Is at and the only corporation we're talking to? Uh, we'll talk to anyone who wants to talk to us, ultimately, right? The broadband master plan is really agnostic as far as um, the individual, uh, the companies that actually do the work, right? Um, and then we basically just identify the areas that are the highest priority. And then as state and federal monies come in, uh, usually we'll basically use that money to subsidize some extension of service to a specific area. So we'll say, um, you know, here's another half million dollars available if you can get service to this neighborhood uh, and allow the private companies to bid on that. Um, so we did that with some fun. Uh, we, we took some of the our COVID money, the American Rescue Plan Act funds, uh, about half a million dollars and did a very similar process. Um, and Cruise IO ultimately won that bid, and they're doing a wireless solution and working with all the schools to putting uh, putting up new, um, you know, basically wireless access points on Live Oak schools. Uh, now they're talking to some of the other school districts as well. So, so that's just an, staying up there. As far as I know. Oh, okay. Because I heard that they were trying to. The, they were out. They were the, out. Yeah. I mean, I've got phone service with them, but I thought for internet and everything, they weren't going to. They used to provide DSL, and many of us were right. legacy DSL providers. I remember that from last. We had our contacts actually through Cruise Island. Right. And they cut us off. Okay. Uh, we went to their executive team to get an exception. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, we got Starlink. It's incredibly mm. faster, far cheaper, and more reliable. Did you say Starlink? Yeah. It's fine. I looked at the map for Starlink, and it looks like we're in the shadow. No. Well, what the problems happen to be is you've got trees around you. Yeah, that's 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 the problem. Problem. We've got a good clear view, and yeah. it's been working well. I've got Comcast. But, so we can yeah. have a, okay. Yeah. Much of Granite Creek has nothing. There's yeah. no cable. Mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. no, um, Ports have been very expensive from yeah. fast to, to run things out. Got it. 
Okay, um, we just passed a sustainability update at the board at our last meeting this this Tuesday. It is uh, really the largest change to the general plan in over 25 years. Um, and it sets the intention for uh, our county with the general plan language of uh, building housing that is more sustainable because it's more walkable. So having a 15 minute community uh, where you can walk to school, uh, the doctors, a park, uh, the grocery store. Now, obviously, it's a little bit less applicable out here in Happy Valley, but um, it, it will lead to a lot more infill development within the urban services line of our county. I think the part that is most applicable out here in Happy Valley is we're also trying to um, really help promote both agriculture and tourism, the two largest industries in our community, um, and make it easier to start agriculture, uh, agricultural businesses. So a lot of the zoning in this area that you see on this map, this light green, is what's called uh, agri just agricultural zoning. Now that's in contrast to commercial ag zoning, and it's got more of a focus on um, you know, family operated business um, where people live on site. And the, the sustainability update makes it easier to do uh, business related to agriculture in these zones. So whether it's agritourism and education, uh, farm stay or homestay programs, having a produce stand, opening a winery, brewery or distillery, uh, hosting events like weddings, if it's on a parcel more than eight acres, uh, or having some kind of agricultural processing facility. Um, so those are opportunities that uh, maybe you or your neighbors would wanna take advantage of, um, and also just be aware they could, could be something that other folks will, will look at at this point. Can you explain the difference of the colors on this chart? Uh, sure. So the, this is just a snapshot. This is um, looking at Granite Creek Road and Branson 40 Drive there in the bottom uh, left-hand corner and the area above that. And so it's this is showing the general plan designation for those areas. And as you can see, most of it's light green, and that's agricultural zoning. Um, the darker green is T, uh, TP, Timber Harvest Preserve Area. Um, and the light green is RA, residential residential agricultural. Um, so not as many sort of business type activities are allowed in residential agricultural. And the blue? Did you say timber harvest? Yeah. And so we're going to be cutting trees down, but that's okay here? Well, it's um, it's really means that the focus is, it is maintaining an active forest there and that does allow for logging under you know if you get a permit and go through all the steps um, but we do want to continue to have a certain number of parcels that have active forests on it because um, if we don't then like basically big trees can't afford to continue to operate here because there's not a, a minimum number of, amount of acreage um, so we don't want to really lose too much more land that even could potentially be harvested for timber what, what is the blue? Uh, the blue is special use. Um, so that is sort of a, a you know, grab grab bag zoning. Yeah. Or usually it's because there is, I mean, it, um, yeah, some special purpose there. I don't know off the top of my head what those particular properties are that were. Oh, that's, you know, I think that actually might be uh, Chaminade we're looking at there, that large blue parcel. Yeah. yeah. Um, another th other things the sustainability updated did was create a new, uh, more streamlined permitting framework um, so that you don't, instead of like seven different levels of permit, um, there's just, uh, we just define it in terms of, uh, you know, who you need to talk to, whether it's the zoning administrator or the planning commission uh, or come to the board, but it should be a little bit more straightforward. We're also increasing staffing resources in the planning department just to try to help uh, get permits out faster. So if people want to build, they can. Uh, the sustainability also, update also supports uh, state legislation, SB9, which went into effect at the beginning of this year, that allows um, any, any single family zone parcel to have two primary dwellings on it. If you want to build a whole second house for your friends or children, you can do that. Yes. So what's the, acreage, what's the acreage that used to be, what was it, one home every two acres? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I... I don't know off the top of my head if there's a minimum acreage. Um, 
But if you're interested in doing it, there's a whole uh, how-to process. I can give you the one pager on it. So that's in addition to an ADU. So you could also put an accessory dwelling unit. And an ADU. ADU, yes, yes, you can. So that's three. You can, you can actually each each home can have their own ADU, so you can actually do four on a on a parcel, and and. Well, how is that affected by the? I mean, we wanted to recognize the existing stuff and mm -hmm. that is environmental health, and they mm -hmm. yeah, boom. Okay. You can't do it basically, is what they call it. it. Is that related maybe to your septic system? Yeah. Um, I mean, it was the existing septic system engineered million years ago, whatever, but... Um, yeah, that can definitely definitely be a limiting factor if your septic is, either, I mean, just either needs to be upgraded in order to actually uh, support that increased usage. Um, yeah, obviously... How that worked out over the county? I mean, I know that's a major block to rebuilding in the CBU fire area, mm -hmm. and uh, apparently there's very little recourse to prove that you actually don't need what they say you need is there anything changing on that? Um, as far as the, I don't know if what the appeals process would be if you feel like the environmental health has basically said that you need a greater septic capacity than, um, I mean, I believe that's all defined in terms of the number of bedrooms that you have and, uh, you know, basically how many people would be expected to live there. I have, yeah, so I haven't seen any appeals for based like, you know, the size of the septic system that's required. It's, it's not just a sizing problem. The new, the new requirement is that you have a separation between groundwater and right. septic. And that, well, they call first water groundwater. So suddenly, um, something that was totally legal up till very recently is, is, is totally illegal, whether it's sized correctly or not. Uh, I just wonder, mm. are you talking about that stuff? Or? Sure, yeah, it's not as... It doesn't tend to be as much of an issue here. It's really a big problem in the San Lorenzo Valley where there's just, you know, no, no sewer system at all. Everyone's on septic and a lot of people have wells. And so there's a really close proximity between wells and septic systems and the septic systems aren't well maintained. So you can see why that might be a problem, mm -hmm. not to mention the soil is very sandy in the bottom of the San Lorenzo Valley. So it's uh, it is that's why we have made these new requirements requiring a certain distance between a well and a septic system, and also um, the minimum size of parcel needs to be at least an acre now in order to have uh, a, sept a new septic system. So yeah, that, those, those all, the, they, are, they are challenging, but if you're dealing with a specific uh, septic question, I'm happy to help walk you through that and talk to environmental health. They have some pretty good uh, new septic systems. I remember when I was on the board of the fire department, we put a new one in down there. And it's kind of self-contained, mm -hmm. and there's not a leach field like there used to be. It just runs out into a percolation thing, just um, just barely above below the ground level. Mm -hmm. There's there's some pretty good. Things. There are some great new advanced treatment options. They can be a little pricey, uh, yeah. I'm afraid, but there are options. The last thing I'll mention uh, as far as housing options, uh, the board passed a tiny homes ordinance. Um, it finally uh, went into effect at our, after our last meeting and had our, its second read. So you're now allowed to have uh, a tiny home on wheels on your property. It can be either as a primary residence or as an ADU. Um, pretty much you, you just you do need to have it hooked up to utilities and it needs to be on a gravel or cement parking pad. Um, but otherwise, it's a pretty straightforward process, a ministerial permitting process. Um, is, is in place just so we can keep track of how many tiny homes on wheels are being placed throughout the county, and also so that we can count them towards our state requirements to build more housing. Do you know if there's like a square footage uh, allotment for that? Or? Uh, yeah, it can be up to 400 square feet. And is there a minimum parcel size? There's no minimum parcel yeah. size, no. Now, is that, would that be the same, like a tiny house to places that have like six, seven trailers on their property that are hooked up? So we, we uh, an RV, an RV is not considered a tiny home on wheels. Okay. Um, so that one would not qualify. 
Um, and you're also only allowed to have one tiny home on wheels per property. So if someone has seven RVs, that's definitely not allowed. Okay. <laughs> this year, this yeah. Year. <laughs> uh, the last thing I'll mention before opening up to any questions you guys have um, is that we do have a couple of commission vacancies right now. So if you want to get more involved, we have an opening on the Santa Cruz County Women's Commission, as well as the Commission on the Environment. I think both of those meet about every other month. Um, so if you're interested, let me know. Um, I can send you a link for the application um, and we'll be happy to talk to you about what you want to accomplish and, and maybe you're the right fit. That's all I got for slides. I'm happy to talk about anything you guys want to talk about. Let me just stop sharing here and bring this back up. Okay. Uh, yes, we just want to make sure that if you do have a question, um, that the online audience can hear you. I have a question about the back to the fire department again. Sure. Uh, what, just one second, and uh, we did have a first no, question. I, I this question, my question is like I'm going for four years. Okay. <laughs> That's about six years now. Okay. Promises made. Okay. I try to join online, but I wouldn't be unmuted. There's no way I can find it, like, interact. Okay. Well, that's why we're trying to, that's why I do the hybrid well, meetings. And I, glad... tried to do it. I was in line doing it on Zoom, and I, I just, there was no way I could, like, interact, so I came here. Okay. Well, I'm glad you made it. So here is, and um, volume is off, but then you, it's unmuted on this. Yeah. Okay. So, so if you, someone has a question, they should speak it into the phone so everyone can hear. Is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. Recording in progress. Mm -hmm. No. You just turn your volume. Quick down. note, supervisor. Okay. If we could ask the uh, audience to say their names as well, just so we can make sure to uh, follow up if there is anybody that we need to provide additional details for. So before you ask a question, if you can say your name, that way we know how to follow up with you. So if you do have a question, right? Oh, wow. What? So can you come into the phone and... Hello, my name is Chris Tapp. Um, I actually am on here. Mm -hmm. um, I'm kind of a... Oh, yeah. A little bit deterred. Okay. Because um, about six years ago, these planes started flying over my head. Woke me up at six o'clock in the morning. Okay. Mm hmm. Because they changed the whole route. Okay. Then we had this whole big meeting down at the Civic Center, which the whole place said that I was ready to go to war. I mean, I was ready to like start a class action suit, start picketing. Mm -hmm. Because I get every eight minutes, I got planes flying over my head. Every, my, my house was there in 1948. Okay, we never had planes flying over our head until they did this whole thing. And the only reason they're doing this is more profits for the airlines and the airport. And you guys living in Happy Valley you know all about this. Okay, well, you guys told us to like stand down in front of the whole pretty much city. Okay, Civic Center. Mm -hmm. And so I stood down. I didn't do, I didn't file a class action suit. I didn't start walking around with a picket my first time. Mm -hmm. I didn't do squat. And now, especially now, this is just storms coming. The planes are exceptionally loud. Mm -hmm. When I talked to the, your, your predecessor, he said, oh, there's nothing we can do now. It's too late. Okay, you guys told us to stand down and do absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. Okay, because you guys had this. You guys haven't had this. Okay? And like, I'm sitting here in my garage every eight minutes. I got planes flying over my head. They wake me up at two, three o'clock in the morning and I've got like a lot of insulation and, you know, Anderson windows in my house and stuff. Mm -hmm. 
Now, my question to you, sir, is are you talking about two sides of your face? Because this is your responsibility. If you took it over from the person you took the whole thing over from, or what? You just, I mean, what's the deal? I mean, I'm totally screwed. I mean, my house, I mean, my whole life, the according to the state, is that, okay, when I have the right to quiet enjoyment of my property, that's been proven a bunch of times by the Supreme Court. I said this at the, at the meeting there. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have the right for that. Uh, yeah. So because the, the, the planes, the, everybody's making more money. Now I don't have the right. Now I've got to listen to this. I, I hear you, Christopher, uh, the, how extremely frustrating it is. Have been out to some properties like yours. I'm, I mean, not yours, obviously, particularly, but to, to I, and experience that having the constant planes overhead. And I certainly understand how frustrating it, it is. Uh, when I first took office, did everything I could on this issue in terms Basically, of. Basically, I'm screwed. The, uh, the, it, the government said one thing. And they're doing something else. They told the whole town hall in front of the civic auditorium. They said all this stuff. And basically what's going to happen is nothing. Well, there's been, unfortunately, at the local level. nothing. Yeah. Thank you very much. Well, this is how come I voted your guy out. Hey, well, if you'd like to contact anyone. the per Contact. Well, you, you know, I talked to the guy before it was your place. Well, I don't, so what do we do? You guys told me to stand down. I was going to do a whole class action suit. I had a whole agenda. Okay, I was going to go to war. Well, I think you... evil shit. Okay, and sir, what I... happened? What... You guys should be talk out two sides of your face. I would contact Jimmy Panetta I or for you again, sir. All right, it's just so it's that's the, the best Fed. Come up with it. That's the best. Can you, can you guys live in this valley? I know you hear the same shit I do. And. What's he saying? Jimmy Panetta is responsible for the Federal Aviation Administration. No. I have tried contacting him, and I file a class action lawsuit by all means. Okay. Now, hasn't it gotten better? They, 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 they come over here about 11,000 feet, going into San Francisco. San Jose, they don't. So these are all the, mostly going to San Francisco. Correct, yes. Yeah. I used to be a pilot, and I, I watched this little... Uh, uh, flight radar 24, and mm -hmm. you can you can, it's a program you can look at. Right. You hear a plane go over, you can look it up and see right, what right, plane right. it is, who it is. What... Sure. So they're they're about eleven thousand feet when they come across here. Mm -hmm. And I remember kind of what he was talking about. They were talking about pushing them. They used to come up over the water mm -hmm. by Davenport and then cut back in. And they were talking about making them do that again, but. I've noticed yeah. a difference. They don't come by as much as they used to. Don't bother me anymore. Yeah, I guess they just like they were coming here. We want to go, and not anymore. I I may hear them maybe twice a month, and yeah. I I understand. I mean, all, all, it's fine. Uh, you know, all, ultimately, uh, we don't have a lot of channels to to take action at the local level anymore. For a while, we had a regional roundtable where we were working with the other jurisdictions, not only here, uh, including Santa Clara County and numerous cities over the hill. Um, unfortunately, that was disbanded, and the FAA says we're only going to listen to a collection of cities because, at the end of the day, it's a matter of where the flight path is. It's going to impact someone. So, in any case, I've done everything I can to try to contact our federal representatives, Jimmy Panetta and Anna Eshoo, who do oversee the FAA. Um, and I think at this point, any further action is really going to have to come directly from them. So. Uh, yeah, well, you had a question about the fire department, sir. We missed that. We missed that part, so I'm glad you can talk about it. We'd love to hear what you said. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I just wanted to say that um, I was on the fire board for about 20 years here in, in uh, about 40, and They've been talking mergers with Central and Santa Cruz, and for the last 20 years, 25 years, they've been talking about it. So, and then we were lacking money. 
Um, so then Scotts Valley took over the admin part of it. Mm -hmm. And and they did that for a couple of years. And I apparently I'm I'm kind of out of it now, except uh Pat O'Connell's a friend of mine and he kind of clues me and he's on the board and he lets me know or I call him and question him on what's going on. But um anyway, so the merger thing is like, well, we'll see, you know. So Scotts Valley has cut Brant's 40 loose again, and Brant's 40 only has enough money for like usually one guy, and they wait on you know volunteers to come. Our, my right. son worked there for 22 years, and so I, I kind of know the inside of how that happened. And then I heard that if if they merge, they're kind of holding us property owners hostage because you know i heard a figure of like seventeen hundred dollars per parcel mm -hmm. um, in addition to the three or four hundred that we pay now um that's a lot of money you know i'm retired and there's a lot of retired people that live up here and that's just another hit that we can't afford mm -hmm. um so i was i've also heard that cal fire not recently but cal fire would take over this station um and that would be i'd like that mm -hmm. and that'd be a good thing i hate to see this station actually i worked on building helping build the back part of it and the front part of it and it's really nice mm -hmm. and i kind of hate to see it closed up and if it merges would it not be brand forty anymore this sign would go it won't be brand 40 fire anymore uh I, I don't know about the naming, uh, the naming of the this the building, yeah. um, but right, it would ultimately they would have to decide on a, a new name for. Well, I think um, like Central merged with Aptos, and Aptos still has like they still have their their station, their name on their stations, mm -hmm. but they're all right, going through. right, yeah. Um, I mean, the, I think that uh, I'm not an expert on this and, and Joe unfortunately left, but I mean, I do think that um, from a fiscal perspective, I mean, I've seen some of the reports that have been done by LAFCO looking at all of the different fire departments throughout the county. And certainly it would be, you know, Brands of 40 is one of the highest costs per capita and has one of the slowest response times um per capita there's other challenges around the level of service being able to that they can provide as far as not having paramedics on staff um so i think there i mean there's obviously a lot of reasons why they're looking at the merger and i think it would be both a financial benefit um as well as uh probably lead to some improved level aspects of service i don't think it's a matter of the scotts valley fire department saying you know, if we come in, we're going to have to close this. My understanding is that there's actually state requirements that it be staffed, uh, have greater staffing levels of two or three people. And so that's ultimately what either the Branson of 40 fire would have to figure out on its own or through Scotts Valley. Um, and so one way or another, that would have to be paid for. Uh, I mean, we've just we've really seen a challenge throughout the county uh, as far as um, volunteer firefighters go. Uh, partly because the level of education required at this point to be a volunteer firefighter is so high that there's not that much jump to become, uh, you know, a fully paid professional firefighter. And so that's exactly what happens is Cal Fire says, great, you trained them up for us and we're happy to hire them. That's so it does have a really good does have a robust has program. Has, yeah, has a really good volunteer program. And it's a stepping stone, like you said, to you know big city fire departments um so they have a big turnover mm -hmm. you know but i know that uh grass of 40 has trained so many people that are salinas you know watsonville santa cruz yeah. San Jose. um but then once they get what they need they go yeah well it sounds like you're very they have a lot of experience on this and i know they're looking for two new board members so man, i think you i think you just volunteered all right, I know we've got a question in the online audience with Darius. There, Darius, go ahead and uh, unmute yourself. So, hey, um, 
Hold, hold on one second. How did maybe you want to put it on the computer? He just did. Can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you now. So what's going on with all of the RV um, posting up along branch of 40? You know, that they cut down the bench lands and this my worst nightmare, our worst nightmare is they're all going to, you know, the diaspora begins and they all go and up to the Pogo Nip. And now the RVs from Delaware and elsewhere are, up, are just lining up on Branch of 40. Is anybody, I'm, what's, yes. the, what's the latest on that? Thanks. We want one second. Yeah. So Darius, we did discuss this at the beginning of the meeting. Um, so oh, I'll be a little okay. bit briefer now, but uh, basically I am working with both the uh, city of Santa Cruz Parks Department and city of Santa Cruz P Police, as well as our sheriff's office here at the county and, and public works department. Um, because so the uh, police department did update the signs there along uh, De La Viega Park to say instead of no parking overnight, no parking over time. It's municipal code, so it needs a police officer to enforce that code, a city police officer. Um, so this was uh, just news to me as of uh, this morning, our sheriff's office looked into it and whether or not they could enforce it. Uh, they can't, although they're happy to act as partners for uh, neighboring areas. So we'll uh, work with, with parks and the police department to get it in there it's um, and make sure those, those folks in their RVs move along. Uh, our sheriff's department does have a pretty robust program as far as actually towing RVs, more robust, I think, than the city's department. So um, I'll see if we can get them involved. Um, if uh, there's there's RVs that have been are being parked there for multiple days on end, it sounds like, and or being abandoned. Um, and then the other angle that was brought up tonight was uh, the environmental health angle um, and potentially the resource conservation district as well, as far as uh, oil, people changing oil uh, and and defecating in the creek. Um, so there's there's that approach as well. But um, yeah, it is going to take multiple agencies. I mean, we are, as you pointed out, with the uh, disbursement of the Benchland camp, um, we have seen the impacts in other parts of the county. Um, and, you know, you know, basically, our, we're looking to form some kind of a task force, even with our county uh, agencies, because as I said, it does take really all of these different departments working together uh, to have an effective they response. Volunteers. Yeah. 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 Does that answer your question, Darius? Yeah. Real, hey, and real quick, can I squeeze another one in? Um, just real quick. Yeah. Um, is how many applications have actually been submitted and have any been approved? For what? SB9. Lots of blitz. Oh, well, last I heard a couple of months ago, I, I think we had a couple, um, but I, I mean, I can get that information if, you, uh, if you're interested. Well, spoiler alert, it's extremely difficult to do this. And I'm just kind of curious if Sorry, you said it's extremely difficult to do this. I was saying it's actually it's pretty it's pretty difficult to do that. Do an SB nine split. Uh, it looks it looks uh, and so forth. But the devil's in the details, and I was just curious if what what the county's um, track you know what what's been um, proposed uh, happening there. But anyway, yeah. just, just uh, that's enough for me. <laughs> okay. Thanks. For taking the question. Yeah, we'll get more information for you on how many SB9 applications have been submitted. Yeah. Thanks, Manu. Sure. Any other questions either online? If you're online, just go ahead and raise your hand, click the reactions button and click raise your hand or you're in the audience. Yeah, fire, Rachman. Fire departments. Um, the one that's just up past our street, <clears throat> I'm losing track on what's going on and who's in charge of that project. It's approaching the, the two-year point now. And is that Cal Fire or is it the district? You're talking about on SoCal San Jose Road? Yeah. Yeah, so the Cal Fire is building a new station there. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I don't know exactly what they're anticipating as far as a completion date, but yeah, that will be a CAL FIRE mm -hmm. station. Um, and they're also building an educational center there. Um, the goal is that it'll 
kind of also be a place for folks who are coming to visit the SoCal demonstration forest mm -hmm. uh, to learn about that uh, as well. But so uh, the Fire, is that somebody on duty 24 hours a day? Uh, How does that run? As far as I know, yeah. Some of the Cal Fire stations, they close in the winter. Mm -hmm. they're, yes, they're... Um, so basically, the county has a an operating agreement with Cal Fire um, to basically to, to staff our county fire department. Um, and the county pays for fire services uh, when it's not fire season, so throughout the winter. And the state pays for fire services during fire season, which of course has been getting longer and longer. So our deal is actually getting better and better. So good, in fact, that Cal Fire is getting a little frustrated and uh, talking about wanting to renegotiate the terms. But in the interim, um, we basically had more money and been able to update a lot of the equipment for uh, County Fire slash slash, uh, which is operated by Cal Fire. I was just wondering about um, the fire service in general, like. We had such a bad thing in the last two years with the fires. And I remember years ago, um, the fire department said, you know, you had to have dispensable space around your house. And if you didn't do it, that somebody was going to come out and do it. And you'd have to pay the penalty for all the stuff that you had around your yard, like weeds or whatever. And I'm thinking that should be enforced today because. You know, we could have burned up here. Uh, we were just really lucky that it was all on the eastern part of the highway side and didn't come over here. And I just see so many places with trash and mm -hmm. just unwanted stuff around their house. And I think what I think the citizens should be doing more. Property owners and citizens should be doing more for their land than just having you know all this stuff around them and not. And to think that it's somebody else's job, not theirs. Mm -hmm. you know? Well, I have an answer to that. <laughs> so uh, I, I'll try my, let me try my answer and then I'll okay. love to hear what you have to say. Um, so we actually don't have like a weed abatement ordinance at this time. You're not required to, uh, you know, mow, mow the weeds on your property or maintain defensible space. Um, some, I mean, I know San Mateo County was looking at it. Last I talked to Cal Fire Chief Nate Armstrong, he said he was working with them on that. So it's certainly something we could implement here in the county because, I mean, as you said, uh, I mean, or as you know, we do deal with derelict properties in one form or another. Um, and um, it, we certainly could create an ordinance to, to require people to do that. Of course, then enforcement becomes a challenge in our we, we might end up paying for a lot of service and having a hard time collecting uh, on, on, to, to pay for that service. Like at that time, we didn't have these horrific fires. Right. And now we're having them. So like, what can we do to be on guard? Yeah. A, a, a couple of things you can do. Um, first of all, we've tried to be proactive, like with the Resource Conservation District, offering free trip chipping programs. Uh, those are usually in the spring. Um, and then... Um, also, join your neighborhood FireWise community. That's a great way to get involved with your neighbors. Just, first of all, you know, looking at what they've done, looking at what you, the challenges on your own property. In some cases, the your fire district um, will come out and help give advice on where you could improve defensible space around your property. Um, and ultimately, it's a way to create a plan for your neighborhood to reduce fire risk. Um, you, uh, I think there's a, a requirement to either invest a certain amount of time or money in terms of starting to reduce that fire risk. But then once you become a certified FireWise community, that also makes you more eligible uh, to get to get further grants from state uh, state funding. So what that- What was the name of the group? FireWise, yeah. Okay. And I'm not sure exactly where you live, but there are a couple uh, here in Happy Valley that you could join. I live out in Mystery Flat Road, so we're kind of in a little valley. Um, the Cal Fire came up a few years ago and they went through it for everybody to go. They went. You can look at Firewise. Uh, so, just Google it and you'll find the links to the county. Yeah, yeah, Firewise Santa Cruz. I, uh, I went on when I was I was a volunteer here also, and I went on some wildland fires, and they would assign us to go through neighborhoods with red tape and black tape, and we walk up through the housing through the neighborhoods, and if there wasn't defensible space, if they had junk all around their house black tape 
And then that means the fire crews just go right by there. Mm. They're not even gonna, mm -hmm. they're not gonna waste their time. They're gonna waste their time and mm. lose their time on the houses that have defensible space and the people have done. So, I mean, it's like, right. you know. Yeah, that, that is also- I didn't like having to do that, but I mean, that's- The reality, yeah. The reality of it, yeah. Uh, I don't like rule. I don't like rules. Like as far as having someone come out and tell me what to do, I kind of know what to do. It's a lot of it's common sense, but um, I don't want any more rules put on me. Right. <laughs> well, well, it does help to have a you know, like with anything in life, have a group of people working towards the same goal. So definitely check out uh, your Firewise community. And there's also other stuff like making sure you've got the right. Uh, you know, highly good visibility signage for the fire department um, so that they can find your property in case of an emergency. They'll make signs for you, those green signs. They're like $15 or something. Fantastic. Darius, did you have another question? Yeah, I just, uh, real quick, uh, getting back to the comments on uh, the septic requirements aren't relaxed for them, are they? They're not not uh, relaxed. So you either have to have the tiny home on wheels hooked up to a septic system or be on a property where there is septic. So what um, our environmental health department will tell you about alternative um, alternatives to septic like composting toilets is that they they they're, they don't disallow them, uh, but they want to they want there to be a septic system on the property. And so it has to really be sort of a secondary option. But if it's a primary, if, if someone's living in the tiny home uh, full time, you, I think you'd have to have it hooked up to septic, really. Got it. Thank you. All right. Any other questions, comments, topics? All right. Well, uh, Rockmont? Yeah. You're probably tracking along what's going on with uh, KSCO, and I, I know that uh, MZ has been in contact with your department about the regulations that the planning department tried to put on its property that haven't cut back. I wonder where that stands at this point. Sure. Yeah, so just make sure you guys can hear online the question is about KSCO. Um, yeah, so I, I did try to help MZ with the path. Um, he, um, first of all, was two years into a stipulation, a, a, an agreement that he signed to do something. And then really right before the very last deadline is when he reached out to me. I gave him some options that he could work on. He didn't do those things. Um, created a situation where it was very hard to, to help him move forward with, with dealing with that. Um, so, I mean, all, last I've heard is that he's planning to sell the property um, and the radio station. I was listening to him yesterday. Yeah. And he's, it's for sale. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I've offered to help him with that in, in any way possible. Um, you know, it is the, the whole, the whole lagoon, the whole property, or just the business. He's got right. Uh, you know, yeah, he, he, of course, it is challenging that he's right there in the in the coastal zone, and so some of it's out of my hands as far as what. Really challenging. Yeah. What? Yeah. The chat question someone asked again about boulders. If we could maybe just address that, that the boulders cannot be put up along rent supporting. Yeah. Okay. So if the question is about boulders uh, to prevent people from parking along Branch of Forty Drive, I did discuss that option with Public Works, our Public Works Department yesterday. Uh, they said they wouldn't really want to do boulders because if someone runs into them, you die. Mm -hmm. um, so, but they'd be happy to do K rails or some other alternative, and we just need to discuss it with uh, the they they'd, they'd want to hear from the city parks department who who runs De La Viega Park that that's what they want us to do. Um, we wouldn't want to preemptively deprive people of accessing the park if that's not in the park's interest. I see the K rails is taking them a long time, and meanwhile, I feel like more people are going to come there and park there, and it's going to create more of a a camp. Sure. <laughs> because we just started out having one or two people there, and now, like, yeah. just because on any given day, there could be five or six cars there, and then they flow over into the no parking area too. Yeah. So it's not. It's not. Um, I just feel like we're not getting the support that we need to keep it 
under control. Totally hear you. I'm gonna work with all the entities I, I, I mentioned to try to be as proactive as possible about it quickly. Because like I said, if there's one thing we've learned, it's that we don't wanna let these camps continue to grow. Right. And the other thing is, though, at Life Act, sorry, George Washington, when lots of groups have their big barbecues and picnics, cars do exactly there, right, right, which is which is okay because they're just there for yeah, they're going to leave. So if they're going to leave, but then if you put their rail there, they're not right. Yeah, that's exactly you know, the challenge. I mean, with the sign there, the only thing I could suggest is everybody start calling in and saying there's people parked here, and it's no parking, no overnight. Parking. Right, right. So everybody. Keep calling in that spot there. Yeah. And people can still enjoy the barbecue. And you can park as it's supposed to be, especially George Washington. It, it'll be my first call tomorrow morning to no. Chief Escalante. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. you said you ride your bike out here. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know how scary it is to ride along Westwood Drive on a bicycle. Um, there's nowhere to go. And, and the traffic, mm -hmm. I ride a bike too. So the traffic, uh, you know, a lot of people are real courteous. Some people aren't. But with those people camping down there, you go by and their doors are open oh, yeah. mm -hmm. on the traffic side. So anyway, yeah. if, if they're if they're not there, that would be a real good thing for our neighborhood. All the way around. Yeah. I well, hear you. I feel like it's a children's area to have uh, recreation and be with their family. And when they see that kind of action going on there, that doesn't get a that doesn't present a good year to them like oh I was, was camping camp a couple anyway. years ago out with my friends. Thank goodness I had boots and everything on. Needles right mm -hmm. in front of my place up here. I've never yeah. seen that ever. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's yeah. definitely don't want needles near children and yeah. and it would like the like the park to be clean. Big Joe, is there something you wanted to add? Go ahead and Unmute yourself. All right. Hey, it sounds like the meeting's winding down, Manu. And uh, I just wanted to thank you for your time. What a great forum to interact with your constituents. Thank you, Joe. Hey. Thanks for the, the compliment. And thank you for sending the email to me earlier this week uh, to get things moving. Yeah, no you. worries, pal. Hey, take care of yourself. You're doing great things for the county. Appreciate it. All right. Well, we'll bring them. On that happy note, we'll bring the meeting to a close. Thank you, everyone, Thank for coming you. out tonight. Happy holidays. Yeah. We have lots to say. All right. Yeah. Goodbye. Goodbye.